Hey, we are continuing our look at Romans, and this week we are looking at Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. And of course, this is a continuing uh, dealing with this larger section of Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 320, uh, which is all talking about uh, the judgment and uh, dealing with that issue of, of the judgment of God on all of, of humanity. And so as we look at that, as we continue with that, Paul enters into what is commonly referred to as diatribe, where there is this discussion with a hypothetical figure. And there's always this question, is Paul talking about a pagan somebody who thinks that this way or is he talking about a Jewish person and it's either or or maybe it's both and we're not really sure Paul is going to bring the Jewish people under this same umbrella of, of judgment but doesn't specifically mention the Jewish people by name um, but it, it is in the background no doubt it's because it certainly was in uh, chapter 1 verses uh, verses 18 to 32, it, that was certainly in the, in the undertones of what Paul was saying, simply because of the scripture that he quoted. And so as we look at this, we're going to look at verses 1 through 4 today. And he has just finished talking about this horrible catalog of practices and how by rejecting our vocation as the worshiping of God and reflecting his image into the world and not, not serving him, uh, suppressing the truth of God and the results of that, the dehumanizing results of that, that, that it degrades humanity, it warps the image of God, uh, and that it ends up with uh, minds that are unfit, that lead to practices that are unfit, and there's this big long catalog of things that, uh, as N.T. Wright refers to, a catalog of disaster uh, that is talked about by Paul. And as he uh, moves from that to this uh, following, wherefore or therefore you have no excuse, everyone who passes judgment. For in that you, for in that which you are judging another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge or who are uh, judging practice the same things. So the, uh, the conversation would be like this. Uh, Paul gives all of this degrading stuff ending with this great catalog of disastrous self-destructive actions. And then someone would say, well, we're not like that. Uh, we're, we're good people. We don't, we're not murderers. We're not God haters. We're not blah, blah, blah. All of that list. We're, we're, we're different than that. We, we aren't, aren't like that at all. We're good. Which by the way, by and large is what a lot of people in Western society think about themselves. Well, those people over there are bad. I'm not, and certainly my friends aren't. We don't act like that, and we don't behave that way. We're not gossips. We're not arrogant. We're not uh, haters of God. We're not murderers. We're not disobedient to parents. We're not all that big list that Paul has. And so Paul would say to them, uh, this, is, this is what he is saying to them, by the very fact that you say you're not like that, you indicate that you are like that. By denying this truth of the universality of sin, you are passing judgment on yourself, which is what he says. You condemn yourself. For you who are judging practice the same things. Now, later on, Paul is going to speak about the secret God judging the secrets of the heart. And it may be here that, that Paul is, is already hinting at that you might not do these things in public. You might not have been arrested for murder. You might not have committed any uh, sexual sin. You might not have gossiped about anybody. You might, but there's also, as I think uh, N.T. Wright points out in in in, uh, uh, that in, the, in the commentary that there is this hint of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is saying. Uh, that the the murders, that sexual uh, sin, 
other things take place in the heart long before they're actually practiced and re the real problem is inside us. It begins inside before it's ever done outside. And so there is that possibility that Paul is hinting at that these things are done in secret and that really that's where the sin takes place. It is actually, does it matter that it's actually acted out? Yes, it does. But Jesus is saying, if you have lust in your heart, you've already committed sexual sin. If, uh, if you hate someone, you already have committed murder in your own heart uh, toward them that kind of thing. And so that covers everybody. Everyone has thoughts like this. We might not have actually committed murder, but we've murdered somebody in our heart. We might not have committed sexual sin physically, but we've done so in our hearts. Those kind of things or we have coveted in our hearts, and we would have taken it from them if we could have gotten it from them. And we would have lied if we could have gotten away with it. We would have stolen if we could have gotten away with it. Those kind of things. And so uh, he's saying if you pass judgment on people, you're already condemning yourself because you're saying you're not like that, that you are a judge of these things, and that you're righteous, and you're pure, and you're holy, when in fact you're not. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. We all agree that murderers should be judged. Uh, those who are uh, stealing, that should be judged. Those who are lying, that should be judged. Those who are committing sexual sin, that should be judged. All of these kind of things that we're saying. Uh, and so, it's, it is, and we agree, God's judgment should fall on these things. And of course, when, when Paul is talking about the judgment of God, he's talking about the, the end, God's final judgment. And later on in this passage, he's going to talk about that that judgment actually comes down to works and stuff. And we're going to have to deal with that uh, justification by faith and dealing with well, what about justification by works? What's he talking about? That kind of thing. But we'll get to that later. It's not going to affect us today. Today, we're just realizing that the important thing to know is that by our judging others, by our saying, well, I'm not like that, we're indicating that we are like that, um, that we are, we too, now, Paul is not talking about believers in Christ here. He's talking about unbelievers, whether pagan or Jews. is not clear, but he is talking about unbelievers, and so, and so am I. The unbeliever who says, well, I'm not like that, because every believer recognizes I'm a sinner. You've already confessed that. You've already confessed that God's judgment rightly falls on you, and by his grace in Jesus Christ, the judgment has fallen on Jesus instead of upon you. It has fallen on his flesh, where uh, the wrath of God against sin is poured out against the flesh. Uh, the sarks of Jesus Christ, rather than upon us. But do you suppose this, O oh man, when you pass judgment, or when you are passing judgment on those who are practicing such things, that you do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? And so if we want to continue to say, well, I'm good enough and and I don't need to repent. I don't need God's grace I don't, because I'm good enough. I'm not like these people that God's judgment is going to fall on. What Paul is saying is that you are, by your very denial of that, including yourself in that group that judgment's going to fall on, and you've already agreed that judgment rightly should fall on those, so it should rightly fall upon you. And there was this, and that whole thing about the kindness of God and the patience of God, that goes back into Jewish um, Jewish understanding of God in that there is the outcry of where, why didn't God put things right? Why didn't God do this? And there arose within Jewish literature uh, that it is the kindness of God, the mercy of God. Peter says the same thing. Uh, do not count uh, God's delay as, as slowness, like some people count slowness, slowness, um, because one day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day to God. Time doesn't matter. Um, he wants all to come to repentance. He wants all to believe. And so the Jewish idea was that God is delaying because of his kindness and mercy, because God loves his creation, because God loves people. He doesn't want to cut off giving time for people to come to repentance, giving time for them to repent, to be saved, to be right with God. Um, before this judgment comes. And so it's the kindness of God, the mercy of God. Throughout all of this, it's the love of God that's on display. It's God's love for his 
good creation. It's God's love for people that we want to see. And that's vitally important that we understand that, that God is not some cosmic bully that and killjoy that wants to just uh, suck the joy out of everything and just make it cold and, and mean, that kind of thing. And I think too many people have that idea of God. God loves. He loves beyond our ability to understand and to comprehend. And yet uh, he is wrathful against that which brings um, disintegration, uh, corruption, contamination to that which he has created that is good. Uh, and, and so he does not tolerate that and shouldn't tolerate that. And that's love doesn't tolerate that. And so it is the love of God. And so that was an expectation, the kindness of God, that the kindness of God is supposed to lead us to recognize I'm a sinner and to, and to repent of that and to turn to God. And to uh, and Paul, of course, is going to bring us into the gospel, that it is in the gospel that this revealing of God's wrath is taking place, and necessarily so. It is good news, and that even the wrath of God is good news, because in that, God's justice is putting things right through Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who is the, the righteous judge, that that is all going to be worked out, that it's all going to be put right, and that during this time, that God's kindness is on display, that we have time to repent. And in the midst of that time, we have uh, the obligation, as Paul said, we're obliged uh, to get out the good news and tell the good news that that um, that God, in His infinite mercy and love, through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, sin and death has been taken care of, and that we yield allegiance to Christ Jesus, and the Holy Spirit puts us in Christ, and so that we have forgiveness of sin in Him, and we have this new creation that that's brought forward into now instead of waiting to the end time. These ages are overlapping and that new age has already begun and, and Christians get to be a part of that new age before the finality of God's judgment coming and the new creation, uh, of new heaven and new earth, and we're being recreated in that process already. And so that shows the love of God. And so what Paul is arguing is, and the Christian church there at Rome can go along with the argument and see it, that those who are outside of Christ and who say, well, yeah, those things are bad, but I'm not bad, I'm good, that you don't get to make that category, that we're all condemned. And uh, he's going to condemn Gentiles under God's judgment, and he's going to place Jewish people un who are not believers in Christ under that as well. And so uh, there is, so he's going to say there's no excuse. Uh, there will be no excuse. You can't say, I didn't know. You can't say that uh, I, I don't deserve this judgment because we do. And so that's the final point. The point being that we all deserve judgment uh, and we all agree with that, that it should be. Uh, the problem is that we like, to, we like to make excuses for our own behavior. We like to make excuses for our own uh, making places for those cherished sins in our lives that we keep secret that no one knows about, but God knows. And when we judge others, we are actually judging ourselves and saying, uh, saying, saying, oh, I'm not like that. Um, well, yeah, you are. You are under judgment as well. And don't squander this, uh, this kindness of God that should lead you to repent, that kind of thing. And what makes it even more tragic, I think, and I expect that out of unbelievers. What I don't expect um, is for believers to say, well, we're better than them. No, we're really not. Um, the only difference is God's grace is operative in our lives. Uh, we've been saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, and that's really the only difference. Um, and so that's, it, it reveals a shallowness of our faith when we look at others without being heartbroken, without wanting to share the good news and the love of God through Christ with those who are still in bondage to sin and death. And so, uh, and it also breaks my heart when I see good people Good people, and I know people like this, good people who are great folks who believe that they are good enough, that I'm not like those people that, that God is going to, I'm not like that. Uh, I, don't, I don't need to repent. I don't need, I've not, not done anything. That don't understand the depth of sin uh, nor the holiness of God. Uh, and they are missing 
the love of God for them and they're blind to the truth that they stand condemned as well. Well, listen, we're going to talk more about this later on. There's so much more to discuss as we get into this and talking about this whole idea of Gentiles practice the law, though they don't know the law, that kind of stuff. What is Paul talking about regarding that? And what is this um, judged by our works thing? Uh, what is all that? We'll get into that this week as we go farther into Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. Not as long this time, verses 1 through 16, but it is a tightly packed argument um, that is going to continue for a little while. Then he's going to bring the Jews into this, uh, and we go down to chapter 3, verse 20. And so Romans is not easy. It is a journey, by the way. It's not easy. And um, there's a lot going on, and it requires us to think. That's something big for Paul. Paul and, and his letters challenges us to think it through, think through, understand, know it, know, understand what this means. And so I think that's important as well. And of course, as always, you need to see the love of God in it and behind all of it that is being talked about. In fact, that's true for the entire Bible from, uh, from creation to the recreation. What is behind that is this wonderful love of God uh, and certainly his love for his creation and his rescue of his creation. Hey, listen, I pray that you know the love of God in Christ Jesus because he really does love you. Loves you so much that he gave his son Jesus. You might have forgiveness of sin, eternal life, and joy indescribable right here and right now. Pray that you know those by embracing the truth of Christ Jesus and yielding allegiance to him as Lord and Savior of your life. And I pray that you know the joy of that. And if you know the joy of that, then you know the shalom, the peace of that. That surpasses all understanding that is God's gift to you because that's what God wants you to have. And I want you to have that as well. I pray that that shalom is yours. Hey, listen, I'll see you tomorrow. Till then, I pray that God's blessings rest on you. See you tomorrow.